And then I thought we'd do like an inception thing where I talk about talking in VR, in VR. Um, so this is designed to be a fun talk, obviously nothing too serious, um, but more about my experiences myself with um, speaking in virtual reality and some experiments I've been doing over the last couple of years. So, oh, let me change, sorry, change a slide. Yeah, there we sorry, go. sorry. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd start off with just a few slides on um, just some facts about reality. So I got interested in virtual reality some years ago, and I really wanted like a headset and to try it. But I was a Mac user, and while I actually had some beefy computer power, it was in Linux. But at the time, if you wanted to do virtual reality, you needed a gaming PC. So you needed Windows, a powerful GPU. And neither the Mac nor the Linux box provided that. So that meant if I really wanted to get into VR, I had to buy a whole new computer. So that was a headset, which was much more expensive in those days, plus a computer. And that's a lot of money if you're not sure that you're going to like it. So I waited for a while, feeling slightly cheesed off about the whole thing. But a few years ago, things started to change in the hardware department. And I feel one of the big changes was the um, production of the Oculus Quest, which possibly many of you are wearing. And this was, I think, the first standalone headset, that is one that does not require a PC, but also had sufficient power to really run, maybe not all the VR games, but a large selection of them. And you can see this, is, this graph um, is Steam, which is a, a game-based engine. And you can see the number of people logging onto Steam with a VR set has increased exponentially over the years, with perhaps an unsurprising shot upwards of 2020 when everyone got stuck at home. Uh, however, although VR was originally sort of the domain of gamers, it no longer is. And this is where I think it gets really interesting. So nowadays, VR is being used for all kinds of purposes. Apparently, the US Army has bought a huge collection for things like combat training. Uh, Johnson & Johnson are using it for surgical training, and universities are now starting to offer courses that are 100% in virtual reality. Uh, there's apparently one at Stanford, and there's one at um, Mount Royal University as well. So, here's my next slide. Yes, so some of the reasons I think it's fairly obvious we often think about it. I mean, the fact that you're using an avatar means this is a double-blind interaction. So we get rid, at least in theory, of a lot of our implicit biases. You can tell I'm female because I'm speaking, but potentially I could change that too. And then you would have no idea of my gender, my ethnicity, or what I looked like, or whether I had any facial impairments. You just wouldn't know. Uh, secondly, VR allows you to enforce personal space. And this has also become a much bigger talking issue in the last few years where there's been some problems in really any social interaction between conferences. You may have noticed that Alt VR gives you the option to switch on a bubble. And what happens then is if anyone walks into your bubble, they disappear, they're just gone. So that's a, that's a fantastic way of enforcing personal space. Whereas, of course, in reality, if someone's annoying you, you've really got to put up with them. Uh, you don't, actually don't have to in virtual reality. Um, thirdly, of course, there's sustainability. I think we've all seen that over the last few years, that conferences um, are mainly much cheaper because we no longer have travel and accommodation costs. However, I think we all have also not been terribly happy with spending two years on Zoom. So virtual reality is offering an alternative that would hopefully give you a more you know, in-person-like interaction while still maintaining a lot of advantages of being online without having to have a big footprint or large travel and accommodation costs. And lastly, but certainly not least, it has the potential for a large amount of diversity, including. Now, I put potential because I, I actually stole uh, this slide off Glenn who um, noted in his slides that the potential hasn't fully been reached yet. There does now, for instance, if you're mobility impaired, there's no problem in moving around in VR. You can move around equally, whether you can walk or not. Um, but there is some progress still to be made, perhaps in a department of like visual and hearing um, disabled people. But so um, if you don't have a lot of money, maybe you're a junior researcher and you don't have money for you know, 100 conferences a year, then you know, buying a, a headset is a much cheaper way of traveling and seeing a lot of these events. However, in absolute truth, this is not why 
I got very enthusiastic about virtual reality. They're all fantastic reasons and they tackle some very, very serious problems that we're struggling with in the astronomy community and outside of it. And it's not really why I became super passionate. I feel virtual reality gives you the opportunity to go beyond in-person meetings and to say, look, we're not going to try and replicate you know, the in-person effect. We can go beyond that. In particular, you'll see an image behind me of a virtual reality scene of asteroid Ryugu, which if you visited the JAXA room, you'll know the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft actually visited. Now, if I want to talk to you about asteroid Ryugu, I'd rather do it on asteroid Ryugu. And the ability of virtual reality to control your environment as well as the objects around you gives you capabilities that you simply can't do in person. If you want to look at Juno data, why not look at it in front of Jupiter? Or you know, if you want to look at a 3D model, perhaps you're describing you know, geology or landfalls, then you can do that standing in front of that scene and pointing out to people what you're talking about. So it has a huge potential for an ooh factor for outreach, but also for a serious scientific factor where it's easier to view these things on site. But you can't keep bringing conferences to your research. Virtual reality allows you to bring your research to the conference in a way that hasn't been achieved before. So in this next part, I, I wanted to discuss more personally what I've been trying in the last few years and seeing how that's been working out. So I'd like to start with talking about ELSI. This is a real photo of a real place. ELSI, ELSI is the Earth Life Sciences Institute and it's part of the Tokyo Institute of Technology in Tokyo. And this is a real image of their main interaction space. Now ELSI invites a lot of visitors per year, but of course they don't stay very long. Sometimes they stay for a few weeks, sometimes they stay for a few months. We started really before the pandemic to think about VR as a way of keeping people in this dynamic environment where they can share ideas. And to do this, we actually worked with a small company called Omniscope that's led by Sasha Karoff, who has recently moved to the University of Harvard, Harvard University. And he developed actually not for Altspace, but for another platform called Mozilla Hubs. And he started off by making a virtual LC. And this is a scene from um, actually the creation of that. It's using a program called Spooks, which is uh, native to Hubs itself and allows you to build environments. So the result looks like this. This is now the VR scene, not the original photograph of uh, virtual reality LC. And I hope you can see it. It looks really similar. I was super impressed. So what have we been doing with our virtual reality uh, LC. I mean, first of all, we did some social events, especially as COVID-19 meant that actually people congregating in the Agora was no longer a very good idea. So uh, we did uh, tea time in the usual tea place, but with avatars, uh, or obviously all of which resembled us very strongly, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also did some of the things that we were doing in person, but just couldn't because of COVID. One of these was the Tanabata Festival. And this is um, held in the summer in Japan and the idea is that you hang wishes for uh, next year on bamboo trees and I have a video let's try next so this is a small video of our our virtual kind of oh no sorry it's, ooh, me. this one so this is the virtual tata in Zilla uh, and I'm just gonna, my robot's just gonna browse around. But um, the idea here was that we had the uh, Mozilla Hub set up already. And then um, I actually designed that bamboo tree that you'll see hopefully in a minute. Um, well, here's my wish. My wish was, I wish to see my family that Christmas. That did not go well. I have to say maybe virtual bamboo, not as good as real bamboo trees for Tanata Vicious. So I still have that wish. Maybe this year <laughs> I'll be able to go home. Um, and there's my bamboo tree. There we go. And you can go and you can hang your anabata fish on that tree. So that was that was people came in and hung different wishes, and then you could go and see what other people have put on there already. So it was a fun way of keeping the tradition alive, even during COVID. I have some. Yeah. So this um the bamboo tree. Uh, I actually built myself in a program called Blender. So this is one of the programs you can use to create your own objects for virtual reality. Um, I would say it's not particularly easy to use. Blender is completely free. It's incredibly powerful, but 
of those two things means you kind of lose out on easy accessibility. So, um, however, because it's free and because it's powerful, there are billions of tutorials about Blender. So many so that basically everything you want to do, there is a Blender tutorial, including, it turns out, making a bamboo tree. So I found a YouTube tutorial on making a bamboo tree for, for this Blender, and I just had to add the wishes at the end. So, yeah, this was uh, scenes from the scene. And if you do not want to make your own model, that's quite understandable. There are lots of places where you can just download them. One of the biggest repositories is Sketchfab. And uh, sometimes you pay a little for the model, but sometimes the model is available for free. And then you can just download that directly and then import it into your virtual reality scene. And there's lots of stuff there. That's, um, this is my account. You can see things I've made, like a kangaroo and uh, an ink ball. <laughs> but other people have made much more as well. <laughs> So um, in addition to the sort of social fun events, I started trying to give some talks in virtual reality. Uh, this is, the top one is obviously actually me <laughs> giving a talk in real life at LC. And then the bottom one is um, the army giving a talk in the same place in the, in the LC virtual scene. And then was, um, this was with Omniscope and they designed us the asteroid Ryugu scene. And this is based on genuine images from the Hayabusa 2 mission. So you were stand on exactly where Hayabusa 2 collected its first sample, which it gathered to return to Earth. And Omniscope also designed us one extra scene to tell the story of um, Hayabusa 2. It's a magical scene that's based on the Japanese folk tale of Urashima Taro. And Ryugu, the asteroid name, takes its name from this folk tale. So when I gave a lecture on Hayabusa 2, we visited Ryugu and then we visited also um, the mythological place and talks about the folk legend. And my other movie is an example of that. Yeah. So I asked for volunteers for a local international school. This was the Yokohama uh, International School and it's a small collection of their students said, yep, they'd be up for trying uh, virtual reality. They largely connected through their PCs. And we did have some problems with that. Um, the LC scene, while I like it a great deal, is quite heavy on your computer. But if your computer is not you know, reasonably new, I found people struggle to connect. But once they were in, they had a great time. And we visited, um, started off at LC where I described the mission. And then we visited the underwater palace of Yugu and we visited the drawer itself. And people really enjoyed uh, exploring the scene. What I discovered was when we switched scenes, should be like a wait in the talk where no one talks for a few minutes and everyone just walks around and admires the scenery and then they come back again and continue the talk. Um, we did have some problems because there aren't yet uh, facial expressions really for VR. So one of the problems with that was working out when someone was going to talk. If you're in a group and doing a formal like hand wave thing, then you normally just look around you and you can see if someone's about to ask a question. With avatars, don't yet have that capability. So that sometimes led to no questions or two people talking at once. And we, we had to kind of, we ended up setting up a system of emojis just to sort that one out. <laughs> um, I think in the future, better facial recognition will come. That's currently one of the small limitations that we faced. Oh yeah, so uh, we did some models as well on the scope, built us some of these models. And these are the models you can see in the JAXA room. So do go and check it out. Model of asteroid Ryugu, and also Hayabusa 2 model, and the uh, mascot Minerva rovers all are there to view, and Omniscope built us all of those. Video room. All right, so um, another platform we used isn't Mozilla Hubs and isn't um, Altspace, is one called Cluster. This is actually a Japan-based one. They have some English support is a bit limited. Um, and we did this for our Martian moon exploration mission and we gave some talks there. And Cluster is very good for large crowds with having a lot of people. So um, this is one of our talks and you can see my colleagues on stage have custom made avatars. So it actually looks quite like them. And you get some scenes from that one. So lots of people came, including two giant lobsters for reasons unknown. Um, and then I had a, I designed myself a custom made MMX sweater and uh, 
do some selfies in the main room and our side room. So if you want to design environments for uh, virtual reality, one of the programs you can use is Unity. And if you play virtual reality games, sometimes you'll see that they're made using Unity. And Unity is, again, completely free, at least up until you start making a lot of money, and then I think they start charging you. But for most people, it's completely free. Um, again, like Blender, it has got quite a steep learning curve, and I am definitely an expert. I've only just started learning it. But the fact it's free, that it's powerful, and the fact there are lots of tutorials is really exciting, I feel. It makes it potentially really accessible. And, you know, you can design really anything you wanted with these tools, which I think is amazing. So this was my first Unity landscape that I imported into Cluster. As you can see, it is a very exciting topology with one rock. I am very proud of that rock that you can all see here. So um, the last sort of use I wanted to talk about was just experiences. So these are not live talks. So you can meet people in them. They're just scenes that you can go into at any time and enjoy. And one of these ones that Omniscope again developed was for um, the Mars Perseverance rover. You go into this scene and you can go in on your PC or you can go in on your VR set. And you're standing in the Jezero crater where NASA's Perseverance rover landed. And the green dots here are information points. And you can hit on them and you get a voiceover actually provided by me, um, but also subtitles if you can't stand that and you can turn the sound off. Uh, and it tells you a little bit about what you're seeing and you know what we're expecting from the mission. And that's really fun. You sometimes see other people there too, but it's not time dependent. There's, there's no live speaker. So you can go in at any time and check it out. Oh, this was something that actually I'm terrified about because I'm doing tomorrow. Um, so my language school unexpectedly started virtual reality. So some Japanese classes in VR. And because I was so enthusiastic about VR, I instantly signed up and then I afterwards realized I would have to do the whole thing in Japanese. So uh, uh, tomorrow evening, I'm doing a show and tell <laughs> in VR in Japanese, fortunately only five minutes. Um, but I'm hoping that my excitement over VR bumps me over the fear of doing this in a, a language I just don't speak very well. Uh, so I'll report back on how that was. Um, and this was, um, <laughs> this wasn't educational, this is a Sapporo snow festival. So one of the most uh, popular um, annual events in Japan, festival that goes on in the northern city of Sapporo. And it attracts normal times about two million people. Uh, to this event. But of course, for the last two years, Japan's borders have been completely closed. We haven't had any tourists at all in and you still can't get into Japan easily. Uh, so as a result, the snow festival went online and they produced a, um, they used cluster for this and they produced a virtual version. And I admit it wasn't perhaps quite as good as the warmer. So, you know, pros and cons people, pros and cons. So just a few final slides. First of all, I wanted to give a huge thanks to our future meetings group, um, many of whom are actually wearing the red hats in the audience here. Uh, they're the people who put together this virtual reality setup and these four amazing rooms. I mean, <laughs> I've been blown away by how good this is and I'm so excited to have been part of this. So thank you so much, Glenn, Vanessa, Rika and Claire. Um, please do check out their Twitter and their Facebook page, uh, their website, sorry. And recently as well, they had an article in Nature Astronomy discussing the future of meetings and the importance of um, doing online events and increasing diversity. So, and I just want to say, remember there are four rooms here and they're all really cool. There's one where you can see the pre-recorded talks and indeed I think the live talks now. Uh, there's a Jaxa room, which is my very biased, absolute favorite room. Um, and I got to pick up like things like mascots and the landers and the rovers and I got to hurl them across the room and they would never let me do that at Jaxa. So that was very satisfying. Um, but then also the posters are here. I know they're on Gather Space as well, but you can also check them out in VR, which is uh, yeah, bigger is better, right? I, I find it very satisfying. Um, and then finally, you all got onto Alt Space. Well done uh, for navigating that. Alt Space we picked because it does a lot of events. I mean, it's probably the platform I've attended the most events at, and they have a huge range. They have church services, they have a technical talk, they have meetups, they even have speed dating. Um, there's lots there. So after this meeting, don't just delete your account. Please do take that, take it out because you might find something super exciting that normally you would never have a chance to go to because it wouldn't be local to you. I think it's the end. Yeah, it is. Thank you so much.